Let's begin worship. Good morning and welcome to worship at Bread of Life, Deaf Lutheran Church. Today, the people here leading worship uh, will introduce themselves. So my name is Michelle Lewis and I'm the pastor here at Bread of Life. My name is Dorothy Sparks. I'm a deacon here at Bread of Life. And I'm David Evans. I'm one of the interpreters here at Bread of Life. As I've done in other weeks, I want to remind us that it is God who gathers us here together. We are all um, in our separate homes and separate places and still God works to bring us together into worship. And so as we have done in other weeks, we light a candle to be reminded that we are not alone. We light a candle to remember that we gather together in the light of Christ. And today, as we gather, we remember uh, the Emmanuel Nine, nine people who were killed on June 17, 2015. They gathered together for Bible study and they welcomed everyone who showed up. And on that day, five years ago, a 21-year-old white man joined them for Bible study, and then he killed nine of the 12 people who were there. That shooter grew up in the ELCA. And so we, as a whole church, made up of many congregations, confess and repent and remember. We confess that racism and white supremacy influence and shape our church. We repent and renounce our tendency to turn away from hard conversations about these sins. And we remember the Emmanuel Nine. And so today, as we light our candles and draw close to God, we ask that the Spirit of God will give us life and um, sustain us to act with honor and to address injustice, to address racism and white supremacy where we encounter it. So at this time, I invite you to light the candles in your home. And I'll light two extra candles for the Emmanuel Nine. Uh, 
as we've done in the weeks past recently, I invite you to focus on the candle flame, whether it's the one on the screen or the one in your home. Take some deep, calming breaths. Remember the nine people who died on June 17th, 2015. Remember their lives and the love they shared with the world. And draw close to God as we begin worship. This morning we have an opening litany, the same as we had last week. It's based on Psalm 13, verses 1 and 2. It is a lament, a cry to God. For we feel sadness and grief. We can't understand how the world is so confused and upset and out of whack. So we bring our confusion and our grief to God. We love you, Lord. And so here we are today to question you. Where have you gone? Why are you absent? God, look this way. How long, Lord, will you turn away? How long will you forget we exist? Some days it feels like forever. We can hardly breathe, Lord. We're missing you in this world of suffering and grief. We love you, Lord, and so we gather up our courage to ask you these questions. How long will you let discouragement and doubt win? How long will you let hatred ruin our days? How long will you let fear rule all the earth? Come, Holy Spirit, heal us and teach us. Lead us and restore us. We need you. As we confess and repent and renounce our sins. We do so with a video helping us remember our baptism.
God, who is generous and loving to all people, gives us renewed life through baptism. By water and the word, God claims us in love and knits our lives into the resurrection life of Jesus Christ. United in the one body of Christ, we welcome the gift of the Holy Spirit in all seasons. We rejoice with those of us who rejoice and stand together with those of us in grief. As parts of the whole, we are joined in God's mission of compassion and justice in the world. I ask you to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, reject sin, and confess your vocation of love. Beloved people of God, do you renounce evil with all its lies and violence? We renounce it. Do you reject the powers of this world that move with greed and favoritism? We reject them. Do you throw off the fear that separates us from one another? We throw it off. Do you renounce the lies of white supremacy and its demonic legacy in our country? We renounce them. Do you disown the system that favors white people and constrains life for people of color? We disown it. And do you reject the idea that God loves some people more than others? We reject it. You have been claimed by God's love for great purpose. People of God, do you intend to continue in the covenant God made with you in holy baptism? To live as part of the global body of Christ. To open your life to the word of God and share in the Lord's Supper. To proclaim the freedom of Jesus Christ in word and action. To serve all people following the gracious example of Jesus. And to strive for justice and peace in every corner of the world. We do and we ask God to help us. People of God. Do you promise to support and pray for one another in your life in Christ? We do, and we ask God to help us. Now make the sign of the cross upon your forehead and hear these gospel words. You belong to Christ. May the God of all love and justice give you courage. Amen. We thank you, God, that you heal us from sin. Give us courage for new beginnings and bind us to the life of Jesus Christ. Stir up in your people the Pentecost gift of your Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of discernment and the awe of God, the spirit of joy in your presence both now and forever. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you always. And also with you. Let us pray. Holy Spirit of God, move, swirl, and dance among us. Remind us that you are always present, encouraging us, drawing us in, and inspiring us to be the loving people you created us to be. Stir us during this time together to walk humbly, embrace your love, and do justice in this world that needs your justice. My friends, as I've done in other weeks, I just want to help set up some context for us before we start um, studying the Bible story for today. 
And between last week and today, we skipped over six chapters in the book of Acts. And so what are the big things that happened in between? Uh, the big things that happen is that a lot of people have come to follow Jesus now. So starting in uh, early in chapter eight, there are there is a, a lot of uh, Samaritan people who are converted to follow Jesus. And you may recall that the Samaritans and the Jewish people do not get along. They um, feel like they are enemies of one another. Right. And so the story, the faith in Jesus is expanding out from the core of Jerusalem, from the Jewish believers. Now it's going out to include Samaritans who become followers of Jesus. Then there's a second story about conversion. It's with the Ethiopian man who is an important official in the Ethiopian government or in, the, in a government at that time. And he, um, he is studying and he's interested and he meets Philip in the serendipitous kind of way, sort of surprise that Philip shows up. And the Ethiopian is baptized and he brings the story of Jesus back to his home land far away from what is known at that time. So as the writer of Acts is developing the story, it goes from Jerusalem, it goes out and expands to the Samaritans, and now it's expanded to this Ethiopian. And finally, we get to this story of Paul, of Saul, excuse me, I call him Paul, but Saul, Right, Saul is on his way to Damascus to arrest and uh, eventually kill people who follow Jesus. And as we know now, on this side of history, we know that that conversion of Saul expanded this group of people who follow Jesus even wider out to the ends of the earth. That's what Saul's conversion does. And so the writer of the book of Acts is setting up this story to show us how more and more people are coming to faith in Jesus. And it is surprising who comes to believe and trust in Jesus. Because Saul, up to this point, Saul is the enemy Saul has been persecuting the people who follow Jesus. And so we wonder, how is an enemy of God treated? And Saul shows us an enemy of God is beloved, stopped in his tracks, confronted by God, certainly, and called to do a particular thing in the world. So that is a challenge for us, I think, in the church, because we don't know who we're sitting next to. We don't know their background. We don't always know what they've experienced before they've come to faith and trust in Jesus. But this story of Saul shows us the power, the amazing gift of forgiveness that God gives and brings to us in our own lives and in the lives of our communities. So with that, I'll ask Dorothy to share with us the Bible lesson today. Our Bible reading today is from Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 20.
Saul kept threatening to kill the Lord's followers. He even went to the high priest and asked for letters to the Jewish leaders in Damascus. He did this because he wanted to arrest and take to Jerusalem any man or woman who accepted the Lord's way. When Saul had almost reached Damascus, a bright light from heaven suddenly flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice that said, Saul, Saul, why are you so cruel to me? Saul cried out, who are you? The Lord answered, I am Jesus. I am the one you are so cruel to. Now get up, go into the city where you will be told what to do. The men who went with Saul stood there speechless. They had heard the voice, but had not seen anyone. Saul got up from the ground, and when he opened his eyes, he could not see a thing. Someone led him by the hand to Damascus, and for three days he was blind and did not eat nor drink. A follower named Ananias lived in Damascus. The Lord spoke to him in a vision and said, Ananias, who answered, Lord, I am here. The Lord said to him, get up and go to the house of Judas on Straight Street. When you get there, you will find a man named Saul from the city of Tarsus. Saul is praying, and he has seen a vision. He saw a man named Ananias coming to him and putting his hands on him so that he could see again. And Ananias replied, Lord, a lot of people have told me about the terrible things this man has done to your followers in Jerusalem. Now the chief priests have given him the power to come here and arrest anyone who worships in your name. And the Lord said to Ananias, go, I have chosen him to tell foreigners, kings, and the people of Israel about me. I will show him how much he must suffer for worshiping my name. Ananias left and went into the house where Saul was staying. Ananias placed his hands on Saul and said, Saul, the Lord Jesus has sent me. He is the same one who appeared to you along the road. He wants you to be able to see and to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And suddenly something like fish scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see he got up and was baptized. Then he ate and felt much better. For several days, Saul stayed with the Lord's followers in Damascus. Soon, he went to the Jewish meeting places and started telling people that Jesus is the Son of God. My friends, grace and peace and forgiveness be with you this day and always. Uh, recently, I've kind of gotten out of the habit of sharing with you what is my point. And so I'm going to try to get back into that habit of making sure I tell you what is, what is my goal for my message so that 
uh, we're all kind of moving in the same direction. You don't have to wonder, what is she doing? So my point today is that forgiveness itself, forgiveness is peace and it has the power to heal. And with that, forgiveness changes our future. It changes the way that is ahead of us. So that's where I'm going today. On June 17th, 2015, at Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina, people gathered for Bible study. That day, a white man joined in the Bible study and then he shot and killed nine people. We call that group of nine the Emmanuel Nine. And as part of the 2019 ELCA Churchwide Assembly, blah, 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 church language, our church voted to designate June 17th as a feast day in honor of the Emmanuel Nine. It is a commemoration day when that those nine people became martyrs. The shooter who took their lives is a young man who grew up in the ELCA and in shooting those people, he declared that he was more important than they were because of skin color. From his jail cell, he wrote that he had no remorse about his actions, and that he would do it again. And still, the response to this man from the families of the victims of his violence has been forgiveness. Myra Thompson was one of the victims and the day of the shooting was this day of celebration for her because she had been studying to become an ordained preacher. On that day, June 17, 2015, she was approved. She got approval for her ordination. Last year, on the fourth anniversary of the shooting, her husband led a Bible study at Emmanuel Church. And it was a Bible study about forgiveness. Because forgiveness has become a part of her husband every day. And beginning just a few days after the massacre, her husband and several others publicly forgave the shooter. The 
that message of forgiveness shocked our country. No one expected them to say, I forgive you, including the people who said it. They were shocked too. But those words set the tone for what happened after that shooting. Their forgiveness united the community. Because the situation following this shooting could have easily, easily torn apart that church community and torn apart the wider community. The words and the actions of forgiveness set the tone. Myra Thompson's husband is the one who said, forgiveness is peace. And that it has power to heal. Just as the way forward for Myra Thompson's family has been through forgiveness, another family has found their way forward also through forgiveness. One of the women who died is named Sharonda and her son was 18 when she died. Her son, Chris, in a moment, in an instant, had to become an adult. He was responsible for his younger siblings and himself, fully responsible for himself in an instant. And so for him, practicing forgiveness every day has been a key to what keeps him going. People have asked him about this because this feels so confusing to us. How does forgiveness work? And he said, I believe a lot of people view forgiveness as letting the other person off the hook. Somehow we think that if we forget, we're letting them off the hook by forgiving. But really what's happening is that we are freeing ourselves from that constant feeling of revenge. This kind of forgiveness feels otherworldly to me. And I can only account for it by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit working in and through individuals and through the church, Emmanuel Church, and the Holy Spirit working in our world. It is the power of the Holy Spirit that turns our lives around. And so instead of seeking revenge, these families and their friends and their loved ones are living their lives going forward. And in today's Bible lesson, similarly, the power of forgiveness is amazing. Because for quite some time, Saul has been murdering those who follow Jesus. And now he is ready to take 
his um, his mission out further from Jerusalem. He is going out into towns all around Jerusalem. And on one day, one particular day, he was going to Damascus. He had authority from the chief priests to capture and kill followers of Jesus. And on his way to Damascus, Saul has an experience with God. Sort of like how Moses experiences God on Mount Sinai, or when Jeremiah experiences God, again, on Mount Sinai, where God shows up and is brighter than bleached clothes. Saul is knocked down and blinded by the brightness of God's light. Jesus, in this experience with God, Jesus confronts Saul and orders Saul to stop persecuting those who follow Jesus. Saul is stopped in his tracks. He cannot go on as he had planned because now he recognizes that Jesus is of God, that Jesus is from God, that Jesus is with God. Jesus is not opposed to God and God's plans. And instead, Saul realizes now, Jesus carries out God's plans. So Saul's encounter with Jesus changes him. It hits him and shakes him to his core. It changes how he understands God and God's activity in the world. Paul experiences forgiveness from God. And then, I think I said Paul, Saul experiences forgiveness from God. And then God sends Saul. God sends Saul to testify that Jesus is God. God sends Saul to teach and lead foreigners and kings and Israel, so everyone, really, everyone, to understand God's ways. God sends Saul to tell his story, to confess his sins, so that others can experience God's love and forgiveness in their own lives. Because you see, up till now, Saul's life has focused on revenge. And God's forgiveness sets him free. Saul is set free from pursuing revenge. And similarly, the forgiveness, similarly, forgiveness allows the survivors of the Emmanuel 9 shooting 
to be set free from seeking revenge. To move forward with their lives. Now, forgiveness is a process and it is a one moment at a time process. It doesn't happen all at once. It has to happen again and again and again. Also, forgiveness does not deny that hurt, that people got hurt. Forgiveness does not ignore the pain that's happened. Forgiveness does not sweep those realities under the rug. Instead, forgiveness allows us freedom from focusing only on our hurt and pain. The process, the daily practice, the forgiving again and again and again allows us to refocus on what is ahead of us. Now, I will admit, I didn't want to preach about forgiveness today. Last week, I addressed the sins of systematic racism and white supremacy in our country. How those sins affect how we see one another. That the sins of racism lead us to judge one another because of the colors of our skin. And the fact that those of us who have light colored skin benefit because racism favors us. Having addressed all of those sins last week, I really resisted writing this sermon. I did not want to preach about forgiveness because I don't want it to seem like racial healing will happen if we just ask for forgiveness. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean it. And now let's move on. I didn't really want to preach about forgiveness because it feels too quick and too easy because honestly, we must fight for deep change in our court system, in the way we uh, carry out policing and public safety, in our schools, and in our churches. And I'm here in the church as a leader in the church. And I, I agree, we must have deep change in our church, in the ELCA, and here at Bread of Life. Because we, we 
need to learn the stories of our black and brown and indigenous neighbors. And then we need to have conversations about what we learn, about how those stories affect us. And we need to become more aware of how we cause pain to our fellow humans who are black and brown and indigenous. We, we have to learn about our own sinfulness. And we have to sit with that pain. And then, then we repent of our sins. And that takes time. And a week really isn't long enough. So that's why as I was getting ready for preaching today, I was just like, no, I don't want to preach about forgiveness. Because we have so much to learn. Not just us at Bread of Life, but us in the ELCA. I didn't, I didn't want to preach this sermon, and yet here we are, because forgiveness is necessary. Forgiveness must be part of the process, too, because forgiveness frees us from guilt and from all of those feelings that would keep us stuck. God's forgiveness allows us to be shaped and informed by the pain that we cause to others. It gives us the capacity to be more empathetic Forgiveness frees us to focus on what's ahead. Not forgetting what has happened, but allowing those stories and our history to inform what we do and to reform what we will do. So I'll end with saying this, that the survivors and the families of the Emmanuel Nine, they are leading us. To learn their stories. Learn about the nine people who were murdered after they invited the young man, a white young man into their Bible study. Learn the names of those nine who died. Remember, that their lives poured out God's love and that their lives continue to have that effect in the world. And so today with the ELCA, we here at Bread of Life commemorate and honor 
the Emmanuel mind. We give thanks to God for their lives, for their love, and for their service in God's name. May their memory live forever. Just as God teaches us through the word, through the Bible lesson and a sermon, stories of um, the, what God is doing in the world, teaching us now, God also teaches us as we pray for others. And as I've talked about a couple of times today, today we are remembering the Emmanuel Nine. And we ask God to bless them and keep their, their memory alive in us. These nine people were gifted and loving and faithful people who spent their lives striving for excellence, for connection and seeking God in their lives. They spent their last moments in study of the word and they leave for us a legacy of grace, resistance, and family, and faith. And so today we remember the lives of faithful dedication of God's servants. Clementa. Cynthia, Daniel, DePayne, Ethel, Myra, Sharonda, Susie, and Taiwanza. They lived by your promises, shared their talents with those in their families and communities. Help us to remember them. Help us share their names and their witness so that the world comes to know about your spirit at work in them and through them. Let us pray. Gracious God, we remember the lives and the witnesses of the Emmanuel Nine. Through them, you call us to understand your spirit's work in the world. Everybody says together, they were preachers. Open us to receive the good news of Jesus Christ. Everybody says, they were students. Kindle in us a desire to learn and grow in your ways. Everybody says they were teachers. Instill in us a passion to share the wisdom of Christ. Everybody says 
They were coaches. Accompany us as we strive to run the race set before us. Everybody says they were mentors. Inspire us through the wise counsel offered by others. Everybody says they were leaders. Embolden us to seek out the best in others. Everybody says they were musicians. Attune us to the beauty of your creation. Everybody says they were poets. Reveal your truth in language we have yet to discover. They were barbers. Shape us as attentive caregivers to those around us. They were custodians. Protect those who work, whose work ensures our safety. They were bus drivers. Carry us as companions in life's unexpected journeys. They were librarians. Write on our hearts and minds the wisdom of the generations. They were veter veterans, and they were advocates. Call us to speak and act on behalf of those who are silenced. They were public servants. Show us how to love our neighbors as ourselves. They were legislators. Inscribe your laws of love and justice on our hearts. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. At this time, I invite you to take some time to um, send a text message or an email, uh, get out your paper and pencil and write a note to someone to share the peace. I know it feels like uh, I keep saying the same things over and over again, uh, but as we are still separated, it is still very important for us to take time to check in with one another. People who are not good at communicating are going to feel even more lonely. And so it's really important for us to take a couple of minutes to check in with one another. Um, and now it's been uh, three months since we've been together, that means we've, we're forgetting 
how good it feels to be with one another. So it's really important to take a couple of minutes, check in. You all have uh, your directories, you have a small group of people that you know you can check in with. You don't have to contact everyone in the congregation, just a couple people. And maybe this week, contact somebody that you haven't contacted in the last month. Just take an extra minute to look them up and send them a note. Whatever way will work for them. Uh, and the weirdness of pandemic and of being separated continues as uh, we've talked about in the these many weeks that we've been apart from one another. We still need your financial support. We still need people to send money to Bread of Life. We are checking the mail every day. So uh, your, your money's not going to sit in the mailbox, uh, though I do want to caution against sending cash. Uh, we don't want the cash to be stolen. Uh, so, but we, we do need your financial support. Uh, we are reaching far more people now uh, through our online worship than we had been when we were together in person. So that means we're still working hard to help us um, interpret what is happening in the world, what that means for our lives, what is God calling us to do at this time and in this place? Those are big questions and it's, they're not simple, straightforward answers. It takes time, it takes energy. And we, uh, Dorothy and I are both available for a conversation with people. So if you are really struggling and wondering about what's, what does this mean for your life? please take time to reach out to us. And if people are contacting you and you have questions, you know, let us help counsel you. And just know that the work that this church is doing continues, even though we're not going to our building, the work continues. So that means we still need your financial support. The other thing about giving some of your money it is the way that you connect your heart to something. As people, our money holds value for us. We feel like it's sort of an extension of who we are. And so when we give some of that money away, it means that we invest part of ourselves where our treasure is, that's where our heart is. Our heart doesn't start and then we put our treasure there. Instead, we put our treasure somewhere and that's where our heart is. And so it's a spiritual practice. It's a way of making your faith live in your life by giving up some of your money and giving some of your time and giving some of your other, your talents, those things are all ways that you offer yourself to God. And so it's a weird time for sure. It feels kind of strange that we're continuing to send our money to the church building when we're not going there, when we're not seeing each other face to face. But we are still doing the work that God has called us to do, to share the good news of God's love with deaf people and their families. That's what we're doing. That's what God is calling us to do.
So at this time, we ask you to prepare your offerings and to send them to Bread of Life. So let us pray. Receive what we offer and transform it by the power of your Holy Spirit into enough money, plenty of praise, honest words to proclaim and enact your peace, justice, and love in the world. Amen. Now let us pray as Jesus taught. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. I invite you to stand if you're able to get ready to go out into the world. Let's receive this blessing. God's Holy Spirit is our advocate. Sent from God in Christ's name. And so now the Holy T Spirit teaches you and reminds you of Christ's words. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. Christ's peace and the Holy Spirit's presence is with you always. So just as God gathers us together in worship, God also sends us out. It's not a mistake where we go. God sends us into particular places to meet particular people to share from our experience of God in our lives. So at this time, receive and be sent. Be sent out into the world. Jesus commands us, come out. And changes our life from dark caves of struggle to live into the brightness of a new joy. Jesus cries out to us, come out. And unbinds us from the chains of our past. Jesus invites us, come out. Invites us into a world where the Holy Spirit blows and breathes life of God. So now go out. Into a world that needs the spirit of God. Now go out. We are God's resurrected people. We go out in and with God's holy breath. 